Welcome to part two of our 4th of July special. You should really listen to part one before this. That's sort of how this thing works. But we went over long talking about the Declaration of Independence. And we figured people probably don't want to sit still for two and a half hours to listen to us talk. So please enjoy part two. So our last sort of big segment for today is going to be the first in a series that we're going to do for at least, you know, a good stretch of this summer. I haven't pitched you this this title yet, but, you know, we, you could call it Summer of the Revolutions. We're going to compare and contrast, and more contrast, the American and the French Revolution. And why those two? Basically because a lot of us were taught in school that they're very similar and we should basically treat them the same. Yeah. In fact, the American Revolution now, was not common to refer to the American War of Independence as a revolution until after 1789 when right. France had their revolution. Yeah. In now, fact, we, we don't like to call it that here. We prefer to call it the American Independence Movement, the War of Independence. I think it's a much preferable term. I yeah. think revolution is a very charged, loaded term. And what we call the American Revolution has almost nothing in common with other revolutionary movements. And that's, that could not be more dramatically emphasized than by a review of the document that gave rise to the War of Independence. So that's what we're going to do next. Yeah. That's what we're really celebrating today on July 4th is the Declaration of Independence. So this, this is the Declaration of Independence. A little bit of historical background on this. This was drafted by the Committee of Five as part of the Second Continental Congress. Members of that were, of course, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Robert Livingston, and Roger Sherman. Most of those guys, well, I guess th those guys really hand the task of drafting the Declaration of Independence to Thomas Jefferson, who, very young member of the Second Continental Congress, I think he was 33 years old at the time, ends up writing what is, in my opinion, one of the most brilliant, eloquent, and well-expressed documents in history. So let's go ahead and take a look at that, and we'll see. I don't know how many of you guys have actually ever read the Declaration of Independence through from beginning to end. For whatever reason, people really tend to skip the Bill of Particulars, which is really the meat of the Declaration of Independence. So we're going to go through the whole yep. thing with you and explain to you sort of why this document still matters, what it was saying at the time, and why you ought to care about it. So yep. without further ado, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. And we'll kind of go paragraph by paragraph through this. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Boy, that was a lung full. That's all one sentence. That's the first paragraph. <laughs> yeah. And that's sort of the introduction to the Declaration of Independence. So yeah, what do we get you, just from this? Yeah, it, well, it, it tells you what the document you're about to read is. It is a declaration of the causes that the United States have for declaring their independence. So it's saying, yeah. you know, whenever it's time for someone to be independent, they owe, you know, they owe you a little explanation as to they, they, That's right. They don't owe King George anything. They don't owe Parliament anything. They owe the opinions of mankind something. So yeah. what does that imply? Well, firstly, it implies that you can't just declare independence willy-nilly. Right. You have There's to have be... good cause to do it. Yeah. That's the direct suggestion here. So then we, what we know the rest of this document's going to be doing is it's going to be showing cause. It was very important to them that they demonstrate sufficient cause for independence because this is a huge leap. Remember, yeah. our founding fathers were Englishmen. Our founding fathers had the rights of Englishmen. They jealously guarded those rights. They considered those rights to be the greatest privilege that existed at the time. Yeah. And it's also worth noting, you know, I mentioned this is written by the Second Continental Congress. This is not the first thing they tried. Exactly. There were yeah. numerous other petitions sent to the king. They actually, at one point, they sent America's favorite cool guy to go and talk <laughs> with the king in parliament. That was Benjamin Franklin, sort of our first citizen, you know, the yeah. the coolest guy we have. You know, he that guy is good at everything and he's the best diplomat probably in the world. We'll send him over. And what did the what did the House of Lords do when Benjamin Franklin met with them? Basically just Did they listen to the grievances? Because <laughs> at that point it was just a grievance against the governor of Massachusetts. 
They wanted yeah. the governor of Massachusetts to be removed and replaced, and they were requesting to the king that he do so. What was yeah. the response of the House of Lords? They insulted him to his face. Yeah, to mock him to his face. And he comes back, and that's what ends up galvanizing a lot of the colonists in favor of revolution. Or, yeah. I shouldn't say revolution, but starts galvanizing the colonists in favor of independence. Yeah. And, so you know, this is... I, I just want to say, too, you know, we're past the point where the violence has already started. And even yeah, in we're already at war. They've already called the general. George Washington was unanimously voted to lead the Revolutionary Army. Yeah, even at that point where we're willing to fight over this, fight and die over this, they weren't yet ready to declare independence until July 4th. Yeah, well, you, you know what they did when, when they saw our grievances? They sent 30,000 troops to New York Harbor. Yeah. <laughs> There's the largest expeditionary force in the history of the human race up to that point. You know, yeah. we, we complained we didn't like the Townsend Acts, we didn't like the Stamp Act, we didn't like all the rest of these acts, and we petitioned the king saying we didn't like him, and his response was to send 30,000 troops to New York Harbor. Yeah. So that's what's going on at this point. I, if if that is not a power play and a show of force, I don't know what is. And a lot of that's because, <laughs> yeah, we don't need to get into too much of the history here, but King George was viewed as sort of a weak king, and I think he really yeah. overcompensated for that uh, <laughs> by sending yeah. 30,000 troops. So, yeah, so that that's the context in which the Declaration of Independence is written. Look at this first paragraph again. I'm sure you guys probably don't have it in front of you, but let me just read the very first part of it again. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands that have connected them with another. If King George reads that, what's he going to think? We're the same people, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. We're not, you're not one people. We're not another. What political bands are you dissolving here? And where's his mind going to go next after that? Where, where's, where do you necessarily have to go after that realization? Well, if we're one people, we have the same rights. Yeah. And we've been deprived the rights of Englishmen. Yeah. And so that's... you have a choice here. You can either acknowledge that we are one people and thus under your protection, or you cannot, in which case we are a free and independent people. Other thing to keep in mind, the theory of power that was at play at the time, and the reason this is written to the king is that the king was viewed as owing his people protection. And the people were viewed in exchange for that protection as owing the king their loyalty. So a lot of these grievances, you'll notice, aren't enactments of the king. They're grievances of things that the legislature has done, things that parliament has done that the colonists object to. Yeah. Why is the grievance against the king then? Well, I mentioned earlier, you know, alluded to the fact that they didn't view parliament as legitimate at all, which is true because it wasn't representative of them. They didn't vote for their own representatives in Parliament. But more significantly, because the king had not protected them against these usurpations yeah. of Parliament. So that's, again, the context in which this exists. Let's move on to the next paragraph now. So this is sort of the preamble. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. That's probably my favorite section of the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> uh, that's a real good one. That's, a, that's the one that 
Joe Biden famously remember. misquoted as endowed by, you know, the thing, as opposed to their creator. <laughs> That's, which I suppose their creator is, you know, a thing. So he wasn't wrong, but it was a misquote. So, <laughs> um, well, but uh, what's, what's going on here? Well, lots of things are going on here. Uh, yeah. This is, gee, go on LexRex.org, click on store. Buy a copy of John Locke's Two Treatises on Government, if you haven't already read that. <laughs> this is a summary of that, how long yeah. is it? Like maybe 200 pages, that 200 page book. This is a summary of yeah. that, which yeah. is about the origin of political rights and the legitimacy of governmental power. So this is true. If people will tell you, you know, this is a rejection of an English common law system. That's not, that couldn't even be further no. from the truth. This no. is respecting an English common law system in which at the very top of that hierarchy, so, you know, the hierarchy may go parliament king, may go king parliament, depending on the era, but above that's always going to be the laws of nature and nature's God. Yeah. That's always going to be at the top. So if you want to argue that a temporal authority is invalid, you have to appeal to that. Well, how do you do that? Well, and this is from Locke's first treatise on government, the way that you establish that a government is illegitimate is you show that it does not derive its just powers from the consent of the governed. Is that true here? Well, certainly, because as we know, you know, the famous slogan, taxation without representation, parliament didn't represent them. Right. So obviously no consent of the governed here. And as far as the king is concerned, what has he done? Well, there's been a long train of abuses and usurpations. So he's yeah. taken powers he did not previously have. He has abused the powers that he does have. And in doing so, he has effectively, and it says this about a bit later, but I guess I have to jump ahead a bit. He's effectively rendered them outside of his protection. He's not treated them as subjects. Therefore, they're not going to owe any loyalty to him. And the next section, you know, I, I sort of love the way they introduce the Bill of Particulars here. But the next section, to prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. And then we're going to cite the facts next. So yep. the, this is probably the appropriate time to talk about the fact that this next section is going to be a Bill of Particulars. Well, what's that? That's a legal complaint. This is a lawsuit. Yep. What Absolutely. the colonists are doing, what the Continental Congress is doing, is they are filing a lawsuit against the King of Great Britain saying, you have essentially, you've, you've voided the contract. You've breached your covenantal duties to we, your people. And because of that, we're absolved from all duty to you. But of course, because they were lawyers, you know, more than half of the Continental Congress were lawyers. That's what you get when Crown of Great Britain closes down all the courts and the lawyers have nothing to do for a whole summer. <laughs> you, you, get a, you get a lot of lawyers writing this thing. But uh, <laughs> that's, that was a big mistake, by the way. You know, if anybody's contemplating becoming a tyrant, don't close the courts because all the lawyers will go against you. But, <laughs> but anyway, that's, uh, they felt the need to write a legal complaint against the King of Great Britain. And who's going to be the arbiter of this complaint? Well, ultimately they are but they are very concerned with submitting facts to a candid world, as we mentioned earlier in the first section. So that leads into their Bill of Particulars. This is really the meat of the Declaration of Independence, where they list 28 grievances. Originally, there were 29, but one of them got removed in order to bring some of the southern states on board. But uh, here are the 28 grievances against the crown. First, he has refused his assent to laws the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. So, among other things, what this clause has in mind is that the Crown refused to permit the colonial governors to, you know, sign into law, basically, you know, give the official stamp of approval to various laws that were drawn up by the local governments. Among other things, I want to take this opportunity just because it's, I think it's a really egregious error, and we're probably going to find time to talk more about the 1619 project at some point in the future Ooh. but the 1619 project which has some legit historians attached to it some of it you know from what i understand is is basically I wonder how you know, much they were paid relatively uncontroversial but the sort of overall architects of that project and the ones who sort of set the agenda are not historians and i i had to you know double check to confirm this was true but apparently they have been, you know, 
promulgating this idea that one of the main reasons for the war for independence was that American slaveholders were afraid that Britain was going to abolish slavery and they wanted to be independent before that happened. Now, yeah. that, that was can, actually one, that was one of the laws the king refused his assent to, was yeah. attempts to abolish slavery. Or, or to at least end the slave trade. You're or kidding. That, that 1619 Project of, says exactly the opposite of what happened. Yeah, I think what, what that suggests to me is that someone working for it, you know, searched on the internet for what was the first country to outlaw slavery, and it came up as Britain. Now, that's true if you're looking only, you know, in terms of an absolute ban by an entire country. Numerous states had done it already in the U.S., and most historians of the abolition movement will tell you the British abolition abolition movement, excuse me, took a lot of its impetus from the American abolition movement. It yeah. did, in fact, get a nationwide ban in Britain before the U.S., but there, the idea that Britain was about to ban the slave, like either slavery or the slave trade in 1776 could not no, be absurd. further from the truth. That, that, that's, the king required them to have slaves. Yeah. In fact, that was originally one of the causes in the Declaration of Independence was yeah. about slavery. Yeah. And, you know, it. Britain was still deeply implicated in the transatlantic slave trade at this point. It was a major source of revenue for them, not only directly, but also because, you know, their colonial possessions in the, in the Caribbean were mostly driven by slave plantation economies. It's just completely off base. It's really not super relevant to the Declaration of Independence directly, but it's, but it's just, it's such an egregious error that I feel like- I More to broadly, that. it's that the king had basically clamped down and parliament really had clamped, Lord North and parliament had clamped down yeah. on the colonies in the years preceding the Declaration of Independence previously. Obviously all of these colonies operated under royal charters. The king had granted yeah. charters to various companies and entities to create colonies in the new world. And they were subject to the king, but for the for the most part, they were pretty autonomous. They created all of their own laws. They would never were required to run any of those laws past the king before, but in the past, several years, the king had placed them under new jurisdictional authority and required his assent be given to laws in order for those laws to be validly enacted, and then wouldn't do it. Yeah. Which part of that's kind of necessary because just because, you know, you had to travel across the Atlantic at the time, which would have created a substantial delay for enactment of laws to begin with. But then in addition to that, king also wouldn't ratify laws once they actually did get to him. So that was not great. Second yeah. grievance is going to be he has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained. And when suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them, which is the one that I just hinted at. So yep. you'll see these develop in a logical structure. Yep. First one is he's refused his assent to laws. You have to establish that first. And then next you can say, in fact, he's required his assent to laws that shouldn't even require that assent. Right. Now, it's worth noting, neglect is considered one of the reasons by John Locke in his treatises on government why a government may be dissolved. Thomas Jefferson would have expected his audience to know that. That was an accepted philosophy at the time. He would have expected them to know that was a valid cause for independence. This also has in direct view the Massachusetts Assembly Law, which was a 1770 law. Massachusetts, you know, a lot of the early independence stuff really started there. The Crown basically wanted to repel any possibility of insurrection in Massachusetts and to do that passed the number of laws that were basically intended to prevent the exercise of the people's political rights. The people being Americans, that didn't work out well. It had pretty much <laughs> precisely the opposite effect. Uh, it made them very, very angry. But one of those laws was the Massachusetts Assembly Law. And what that did was prevented any holding of public assemblies of any kind for political purposes. It actually may have been even broader than that. I don't remember the exact text of it. But obviously that violates the original colonial charter the king had put in place, and that's the source of the grievance here. So anything to say about that one, David, or can we move on to the next? Yeah, I think we, we probably need to pick up the pace a little bit, so let's, move, let's go on to the next one. Sure, okay. Next is that he refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. 
So again, this is referencing directly Locke's two treatises on government, specifically chapter 19, which says that when such a single person or prince sets up his own arbitrary will in place of the laws, which are the will of the society declared by the legislative, and the legislative is changed. This is the other reason that Locke lists as a legitimate reason to change or abolish your government, is if the legislature is changed without the people's knowledge or consent. So this is a direct reference to that. Yeah. Uh, grievance number four. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual and also uncomfortable and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. This is probably a reference to the Massachusetts Government Act. Uh, and what that did was it, it basically it nullified the Massachusetts Charter of 1691 by allowing Governor Thomas Gage to dissolve local provincial assemblies. Um, and then what he did was, rather than meeting in Boston, which was the capital of Massachusetts, I think it was certainly probably the largest population center in colonial oh, yeah. America. Is that right, David? I think at the time, yeah, maybe Philadelphia had started to surpass it at this point before. I know it would by the time the Constitution came around. I think at this point, Massachusetts is still the biggest. At at the very least, it's, you know. Boston, I mean, sorry. Yeah, at the very least, it's it's one of the two biggest cities in the. Yeah, so so what Thomas Gage did was he moved the provincial assembly to Salem, which is. About, Famously, you know, they had the Salem yeah. witch trials there. You don't get away with those unless you're pretty isolated from the rest of Massachusetts. So yeah, it's about, uh, I think, 20 or 30 miles away from Boston. And, you know, obviously in the pre-motor days, that's a significant distance. Point okay. is, yeah, Salem is not super close to Boston. It's not, you know, like going to Alaska from the continental U.S., but it's definitely out of your way. And as, you know, the, the declaration notes... It's not where you have your records. It's not easy to reference things that you want to reference. It's not easy to get copies of past laws or, you know, anything like that. Any of the right. materials you would want. Makes it, diffi- it makes it very difficult to defend your rights and to contest what the king is doing. And that's the point, is he's yeah. made it more difficult to contest his tyrannical actions. And as you should be seeing, these develop logically. So the next grievance is going to be, he has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. So, in other words, they, he's done all these things to make it very, very difficult to defend our rights. And then we do it anyway, and he dissolves the state legislatures and replaces them with his own military governors. So Yeah, and like, like we were talking about Parliament earlier in this episode, you know, the English tradition does not have a very sort of definitive way that you actually elect and keep a legislature. The king used to dissolve parliament at his pleasure, in theory. You know, I think, I'm pretty sure that could still happen, technically. Basically doesn't. But, so, you know, you get a government you don't like, you get, you know, a parliament you don't like, you just say this parliament's over, go elect a new one. Does that repeatedly in the colonies, not just in Massachusetts, but yeah. elsewhere as well. It was, Massachusetts was the first... It was done really as a warning to the other colonies, you know, don't copy Massachusetts. Yeah. That was way back in 1768 <laughs> that yeah. he did that. And then yeah, eventually we'll, we'll, he ends up... I, I, I want to say, we'll get into that later, but I think one of the often overlooked elements of the declaration is that emphasis on, like, you know, this is a long chain, and we'll go back... I, I want to go back and look at some of the dates on, you yeah, know, some seven of the famous years ago. things. Yeah, well, he, and, you know, he abolished he, representative government in Massachusetts as a warning to the rest of the colonies. Yeah. And you look at, you know, even just some of the most famous Eight names, like the ago, Stamp really. Act. Mm-hmm. The Stamp Act was 1765, more than a decade before the Declaration of Independence. The Boston Massacre was 1770, you know, six years before this. So yeah. I think we often get taught like it's this quick sequence of events. It yeah, wasn't. I mean, <laughs> it's, a, it's a pithy slogan that justice deferred is justice denied. Our founding fathers didn't view it that way. Our founding fathers were willing to put up with a great deal of abuse before actually doing anything about it. They used legal channels, certainly. They sued in the courts. uh, They brought petitions against the governors. And that's why you'll notice a lot of the things here in the Declaration of Independence are going to be the way the king responded to these petitions. So they passed horrible laws. Most of those horrible laws aren't even mentioned here. You you, You don't get into the details of all the towns and acts in the Declaration of Independence because you know they understand bad things happen 
And we are going to get laws that we don't like. That happens in any free society. You get laws that you don't like, laws that you think are unfair. Where the king really screwed up was he didn't defend them from any of those things by yep. effectively abolishing the channels through which they would normally seek recourse. So that's what that one is here. He abolished their assemblies. They put up with it for eight years. He eventually abolished the North Carolina General Assembly and the Virginia Assembly as well. I think that was in 1774 that he did that. That was once we eventually did start opposing the actual taxes that had been imposed on the colonies, as well as extradition to the admiralty courts to be heard for offenses, which we'll get to that in one of the subsequent causes of action as well. So, number six. He has refused for a long time after such disillusions to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers incapable of annihilation have returned to the people at large for their exercise, the state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. I just love that one. I love that yeah. because the king's view on that would have been almost exactly the opposite. I abolished your assembly because of convulsions from within, right? Because you were rebelling against me. What are they saying? No, you can't abolish the legislative power. That always exists. That's a something that exists purely by virtue of the fact that human beings exist in civil society. That's, again, a reference to Locke's second treatise on government. You can't abolish yep. legislative power. It's reverted to us, to we the people. So, yeah, and, and be, because there's been no body that is able to efficiently administer that legislative power, that is what has left Massachusetts open to invasions from without and convulsions within. Uh, this also, I think, probably contains a reference to the Assembly of New York, which had refused to comply with the Mutiny Act of 1766, which spurred Parliament to pass what they called the Restraining Act of 1767, which formally abolished the New York legislature's authority. So that's you know another thing that's going on there. Next is grievance number seven. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose, obstructing the laws of naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. Yeah. So in this one, you know, I think it's worth noting that even in Britain at the time, you know, you've, you've talked a lot, you know, elsewhere about Edmund Burke's address to Parliament about the colonies. And it was evident to everybody that... That's great, by the way. We, we ought to yeah. bind that and sell that separately. We could. Well, you, not sell. Give as a gift when yes. receiving a donation. <laughs> um, it was evident to everybody, both in the colonies and in, in the home country, that the population was booming. The colonies were becoming wealthy from industry and trade and, you know, Edmund Burke talks to Parliament and he says, like, you know, we should be careful about the way we treat these people. Their population has already grown by this amount. They'll probably outstrip us soon. And, and he points out, Edmund Burke actually points out that population boom is largely from people having kids. Yeah. Because there was a contentious political issue in Great Britain at the time, which was that German immigrants were immigrating to the American colonies. The yeah. king didn't like that. Because that could potentially be a political threat. If Germany wants to assert power in the New World, and there's a lot of German immigrants there, they could potentially do that. In fact, that's the argument that Hitler used centuries later for militarizing <laughs> various parts of Europe, is that there were a lot of Germans there. So, you know, you didn't want a lot of Germans there. Colonist stance, of course, is that we don't, we care about the interests of the New World. We care about the interests of what's going on here. We don't care so much about European rivalries. Yeah. And, you know, it's there's also an irony in that the ruling dynasty of Britain I mean, to this day is actually German in origin and certainly wasn't. Well, the and, time. and that's why Parliament was so concerned about that. <laughs> yeah. Because so Parliament that, was Parliament already feared that the king had divided loyalties. Yeah. Because in addition to being the king of Great Britain, he was also the king of Hanover, which was a German state, a small German kingdom. And uh, right. they, so you know, a lot of this is continue to rule that. So this would have been time. understood. Yeah, this would have been understood at the time as this is your petty squabble over there on the continent. Yeah. This is not our petty squabble. You know, we know that Parliament doesn't trust the king because he's German. You shouldn't restrict our ability to naturalize immigrants because of your stupid political dispute. Right. So that's that one. 
Next is gonna be, he has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. That's what I just mentioned about abolishing the courts. That yeah. had, <laughs> and what courts they did have, they no longer had the right to appoint by their own legislature. They were instead appointed directly by the crown through a series of acts, usually through the admiralty courts. So basically military courts to hear civilian matters. Yeah. And those of you who are familiar with British history will recognize that the British Navy has always been one of the key elements in British foreign policy. So using the admiralty courts to govern the colonies is basically an indication that they were thinking of the colonies as foreign country that, you know, needed yeah. to be under it, the military regime. And it, it did all kinds of stuff. Like it took away their right to a trial by jury. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, but the king made all judges in the colonies dependent upon his appointment. So that's that's sort of the significant takeaway from that. They'll get into the practical effects of that in the next several. Uh, grievance number nine, he has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. Again, royally appointed judges didn't depend on colonists for their income. Yeah. So you it know. matters who's paying your bills. Yeah, you don't want to bite the hand that feeds you. If you're the king's paying your salary and you don't have any other, you know, sort of local friends because you're from somewhere else or you're loyal to the crown over the, lo you know, the local community, you're probably going to try to side with the king. And this actually incidentally ended up being one of the major causes of independence because this is what eventually led the, the colonists to petition for the removal of Governor Hutchison. Remember, that was the governor that Benjamin Franklin was asking to be removed when they famously insulted him in London. Yeah. And the reason that it led to that is because Chief Justice Oliver had declared that it was his intention to seek his salary from the crown. And the people of the colonies petitioned Governor Hutchison saying, you need to remove Justice Oliver because we appoint judges, not the crown. You're responsible for that. And Governor Hutchison wouldn't do it. Yeah. That plus a number of other issues. I won't get into <laughs> yeah. his letters that... He had some pretty crazy letters that came out, which it's suspected that Benjamin Franklin may have divulged them, which is part of why Parliament was so awful to him. I don't know whether he did or not. He was postmaster general, so it's possible. But anyway, series of things that end up leading them to petition to have Governor Hutchison removed. Grievance number 10. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. That is a reference to the Stamp Act. Yeah. So customs officers, officers for the admiralty courts, all these people here to, you know, enforce this new regime of, you know, basically, you know, close admi royal administration of all the ports and all imports and, you know, business. And, you know, so A, people are having their goods looked into, people are having their ships searched, their warehouses searched, and all these people have to be paid, you know. Yeah. They're searching all their stuff to make sure that it has the stamp. Yeah. Because what does the stamp do? The stamp shows that you've paid a duty. That's how you get the stamp. Right. And it, it was on everything. Like, it's ridiculous, the things that had stamps. You had to get a stamp to get married, any kind of importation or export. Yeah. That's It all required a stamp, which meant an additional tax. That's the eating out their substance portion of that. It's impossible for them to make any money because of these stamps. So yeah, and it's, that's, it's, I, I don't want to give a whole history lesson on the Stamp Act. We could do a whole hour thing or more <laughs> on the Stamp Act. We probably will at some point, but we need to keep moving. So yeah. he has kept among us in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. Standing armies. That's another one of the major grievances that ends up being a cause of independence. Yeah. And, that, and that's got some roots in, Brit in English history. Standing armies were always viewed as something that facilitated tyranny. Yeah. It's another sign, I think, that the folks in England, you know, the home countries didn't really think of the colonies as their own people because they would basically have never tolerated, you know, keeping the army stationed permanently in England. Um, you know, from a much later context, I found yeah, this, it's, this from England Orwell. would have viewed it as very dangerous to have a, yeah. a standing army stationed in England, because what's that army going to do? Exactly. And, you know, this is something that George Orwell wrote when he was talking about sort of the English national character. And I think, it, you know, it's, it's a good indication of the way they think about things. It says, well, within living memory, it was common for the redcoats to be booed in the streets and for the landlords of respectable public houses to refuse to allow soldiers on the premises. Yeah, and that, that was so eventually, of course, Great Britain does start having standing armies in Great Britain. 
And Orwell's pointing out this was not popular, even when yeah. he was writing, like, in the 1930s. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been, like, you know, basically before the World Wars, it was a whole different thing. No one would have been on board no. for people keeping. People don't want armies standing around. That's a threat to your liberties. So what does Great Britain do? Well, they don't have standing armies back at home, but they have them here. Yeah, exactly. And that was, you know, I guess, David, do we want to get into the whole... It sure looks like we have a standing army issue. That. <laughs> we probably can't take the time to do that right now. <laughs> I do want to make it clear. Standing armies are very different from standing navies. Yeah. And technically, we don't have a standing army because we do have to pass a new NDAA in order to renew the existence of that army. And it has to be paid perpetually by Congress in order to exist. So our army doesn't end up being sort of an independent force on its own that really wields power for its own purposes. It's really is subject to the president and to Congress, but it is worth asking the question, you know, if this was this substantial of one of the causes of declaration of independence, maybe we ought to think about having a standing army, but we'll get into that in a future episode. I'm sure. Uh, Next is going to be, he has affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power, which is the dangerous aspect of having a standing army, right? Because yeah. if that army is subject to the civil power, yeah, it could still go crazy sometimes. You know, it's happened a lot throughout human history that the army just decides to do its own thing anyway. But at least it's, at least you're trying to protect against it. Here, that's not even true. This is again going to refer to things like the, you know, at least the Townsend Acts. It's going to refer to the Massachusetts Government Act. Basically, the military was put in charge of the government of Massachusetts. Yep. Is what it comes down to. Yeah. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation. What's that a reference to? So there's probably a number of references here. Among other things, you know, one of the terms of the peace treaty that ended the Seven Years' War, as it was called in Europe, or the French and Indian War, as it was called in America, was that the British crown took control of quebec so in other words you know the french settlement in canada and and didn't get rid of its existing laws yeah you know allowed it to continue to operate on a french model yeah the the quebecois were not very excited about the idea that they were going to substitute their system for the british one so as you know sort of a way of keeping things calm there they agreed to let them continue to use french systems and actually enlarged the territory of quebec you know, it extended into what would now be like the Midwestern uh, United States. People were not happy about this. There's various reasons for that. I think that's part well, of it. So when the colonial charters were granted, most of them just stated the latitude. They didn't yeah. state the longitude. So those colonies extended indefinitely westward. Yeah, so you may have seen the some King of these as- odd maps. Um, they've become weirdly popular online from what I can tell. But yeah, that showed like just Massachusetts extending as a rectangle into the West or, you know, Virginia or North or South Carolina. So when he defined territorial jurisdiction of Quebec, that was directly interfering with the independent rights of the legislature over those territories because it ended up affecting some of those Western territories. So that's subjecting them to a foreign jurisdiction. I think some have also suggested this grievance refers to the Board of Trade, which was authorized to act independently of colonial legislation. I think it's probably more specifically a reference to Quebec. Yeah. And I, one thing I want to point out, and again, you know, we have to keep it moving, so I'll keep this short. But to your point that some people take the Declaration of Independence to be, you know, divorcing itself from English common law, I think they've clearly overlooked this part because yeah. one of the main complaints is, you're not abiding by our constitution. In other words, yeah. by English common law, because as we've pointed out, there is no written English constitution. It's the body of legal history and tradition. So to, to suggest the founding fathers in setting up our constitution, set up one that did away with the English constitution is just absurd. They saw yeah. that as integral to their liberties. And we've mentioned yeah. before the Bill of Rights in most cases, reiterates pre-existing rights that would have existed for Englishmen, but makes them inviolable. They can never be taken away now, where, of course, they could be in Britain. So basically, you know, July 4th, 1776, you get a bifurcation between common law in Britain and common law in the United States. But everything pre-July 4th, 1776, as far as common law is concerned, those rights continue to be in effect in the United States in perpetuity. 
So yeah, yeah, that's not at all separating from that. I don't think that was even remotely implied. Just the opposite. So grievance number, which one were we on? Fourteen now. Number fourteen. Okay, the quartering of large bodies of armed troops among us. Yep, we have an amendment about this one. <laughs> we do. It's which probably the most seldom referenced amendment, including our, you know, our poor friend, the Tenth Amendment. But <laughs> we do have an amendment against this. And what this refers to is, of course, the Mutiny Act, which is also that was often referred to at the time as the Quartering Act, allowed soldiers to be stationed in the colonies and to request shelter from any citizen. So. They could come up to you and they could say, we're going to stay in your house now. And you had to let them. We didn't like yeah. that because we like <laughs> owning our stuff and we yeah. don't like it when the government tries to take it away arbitrarily. Yeah. And when, you know, again, as we've mentioned, you've just been put under military administration. If soldiers come to you and say, we're going to stay in your house now, that's not just an inconvenience to you because now you've got guys in your house. The, you know, I think the clear implication is they're going to be watching you. They're going to be paying attention to everything you do. And, you know, anyway. It's like with the Uyghurs nowadays. Yeah. In China. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a, which is a horrible situation. Look into that if you don't know about it. But yeah. similar to that. Next is going to be for protecting them by a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states. Yeah. That's a that, reference yeah. to a specific incident. That's the I think that's the Annapolis incident that's referring to. There are probably others as well, but yeah, so you know, multiple instances, including in Annapolis, Maryland, where I think in, in Annapolis it was the Royal Marines, but in other places mm -hmm. I think it was the army. But you know, troops of various kinds killing people in disputes, you know, ostensibly for like riot control, crowd control, whatever you want to call it. And then And then again, because you have these fake courts. Yeah, that these military operate at courts. The will of the king. Yeah, you know, yeah. you you, you probably don't mm -hmm. want to be a civilian, you know, trying seeking justice for a murder and have to go to a court run by the branch of the armed forces that just killed somebody. You know, that's not ideal. Hopefully, this is hopefully this is building a picture for you guys of what life had transformed into yeah. for the colonists. You know, th think of them living prior to all this, prior to maybe. 1765 or so they were living in a society that looked remarkably like our present day society i mean without all the modern conveniences and whatnot but they were living in a relatively free society and yep. then by gradual blows it devolved into the situation that's being described here so grievance number 16 for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world that's a reference to the navigation acts for sure Yep. Uh, basically what that did was that granted an exclusive trade monopoly to Great Britain with the colonies. Yeah. And created really a system where the colonies would get into perpetual debt because they, they would send raw materials back to England and then they would buy finished goods from England. And the way the deals worked out, they could almost never get out of debt from that. So yeah. even though they had many, many goods that were demanded by the rest of the world, they were required to trade exclusively with Great Britain. So that's grievance number 16. Number 17, for imposing taxes on us without our consent. For whatever reason, this is the one everybody remembers. And yep. it's probably because it became that neat slogan, no taxation without representation. People love but a good rhyme. The, yeah. But this is, again, a reference to the Stamp Act. Because yeah. the Stamp mm -hmm. Act taxed everything you can think of. You know, if you can think yeah. of it, it taxed it. Yep. You know, if the gloves T was the fit, famous must one. Quit. <laughs> no taxation. Actually, hilariously, you know, There's combination of these last two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, combination of these last two reminds me. So obviously they, there was an exclusive trade monopoly granted to the colonies, and that was administered by the East India Trading Company. And what that required the colonists to buy was exclusively East India Company tea. And it's actually yep. you know, largely because of that ban that Americans are by and large, no longer tea drinkers. We're coffee drinkers instead. Because Americans were so mad that we had to buy this East India Company tea that we sort of got rid of the beverage altogether. But Or bought it from the Dutch illegally. Or bought it and I was gonna I was gonna say that next. <laughs> All tea obviously had to bear this stamp. Any tea that was legally traded in the American colonies. This tea actually, because of the exclusive monopoly with the East India Company, ended up being less expensive than tea that we would buy from for instance, the Dutch East India Company. Yeah. What percentage of tea do you think Americans bought 
from the East India Company? What percentage of tea was illegal and not contraband? Oh, I, we've talked about this before. I have completely forgotten, though. I'm sure it's going to be a shocking number, though. About 15%. <laughs> yep. So 85% 85. of the tea purchased was illegal. Was smuggled, yep. <laughs> Even though the tea that they could buy legally was cheaper. Yeah. And that's not counting all the people that stopped drinking tea and switched to coffee, so much so that to this day we're a coffee-drinking country and not a tea-drinking one. Yep. People yep. were mad. <laughs> I mean, have you ever heard of a boycott where 85% of the people are actually boycotting the good? And keep in mind, this is not just a regular boycott. This is a boycott where buying the competing good is illegal. And more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> and more expensive. Yeah. So people were mad, really, really mad. Yeah. So what that ought to show you, too, is when the when the war actually comes along, we, you know, we talk about the Tories that were still in the colonies, people who, who were loyal to the king. Those people still didn't like what was going on. Everybody yep. was mad about what the Parliament of Great Britain had done. They just yep. thought that separating from the king might be even worse. So... Yeah. Maybe a misconception you might have had. I don't know, but that seemed worth mentioning. Yeah. All right. Next one's going to be for depriving us in many cases of the benefit of a jury trial. We mentioned that earlier in reference to one of the others, so I'm not going to dwell on it much more here. But that's also a reference to what happened in Massachusetts. Uh, grievance number 19 for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses. That's a 1774 bill of parliament, which has a very long name. It's called a bill for the impartial administration of justice in cases of persons questioned for any acts done by them in the execution of laws or the suppression of riots and tumults in the province. I almost got that without tripping over it. <laughs> in the province of Massachusetts Bay in New England. <laughs> yeah. And, that, you know, that may remind you of what we were talking about earlier in regard to bills of attainder, where they made a law that's about specific, like, you know, concrete things that happened rather than a general principle you know so basically this is an excuse to bring certain rabble rousers across the sea go face trial in in england rather than trying them at home yeah and this was very very controversial even in england this one was fairly controversial obviously that would be we got to keep moving though so next is going to be number 20 for abolishing the free systems of english laws in a neighboring province establishing therein an arbitrary government and enlarging its boundaries to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies. That is, again, a reference to Quebec. Yeah. Uh, this, this would be specifically Quebec. This would not be other, you know, like other the acts trade that would board establish or, yeah. similar things. I think this yeah. is, yeah, this is just Quebec, I believe. Yeah. We already talked about that, so I don't think we need to mention that too much again. Although, again, you know, that's abolishing a free system of laws. So that's... They consider the English laws to be a free system. That's pretty clearly what David was saying earlier, that they are not rebelling against that system. That is for sure. They're saying the king is rebelling against the laws of Great Britain. Yeah. You know, it's like in, it's like in office space. It's a, why don't you stop going by Michael Bolton and say, why doesn't he change it? He's the one who sucks. <laughs> the king is the one yeah. who sucks. The king the is the one who is not following the laws of Great Britain. We're following the laws of Great Britain. We're being good. So yeah. don't think that we were rebels for a second. That is a... British slur against us. We were never <laughs> rebels. We were law-abiding citizens. So yeah. next is going to be for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally our forms of government. We've talked about that already as well. They Remember, they abolished the charter government of Massachusetts. It's very bad. You don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. And then number 22 is going to be for suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with the power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. So you can see, we started with the sort of the particular claims that had to do with these things. And now we're getting to, here's actually in principle what we object to. Yeah. You know, we think that you are acting in a capacity that you just do not have the authority to act. Our legislatures are our legislatures, not you. So yep. that's what that refers to. Grievance number 23, he has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us, which is sort of the culmination of those last several, isn't it? Yeah. Well, and, you know, particularly, I think it was in 1775, the crown officially declared the colonies to be in a state of rebellion. And that's so, right. you know, they'd be treated as, you know, I, I guess in the modern context, we would say enemy combatants. 
But you know, yeah, and it literally did. Ground. He put up proclamations around the city saying, "You're outside my protection." Yeah, and it's it's you know it was it was urging every citizen that that wasn't a rebel to Quote unquote. turn in people who are rebelling and saying, you know, if you do all these things, then I'll put you back under my protection again. Really pretty outrageous. Yeah. And it's that, that's a reference to the Prohibitory Act. John Adams said of the act that it throws 13 colonies out of the royal protection, levels all distinctions, and makes us independent in spite of our supplications and entreaties. It may be fortunate that the act of independency should come from the British Parliament rather than the American Congress. So again, this is a declaration of independence. It's not a resolution of independence. Yeah. This is declaring what is already the case. Yeah. And it's not know, creating independence. I think, you know, to, to circle back to Adams for a second, you know, because it may otherwise strike you as odd, but he's I think he said it, it's fortunate that, you know, they said we were independent first because it makes it all the clearer who the aggressor is, basically. You know, right. it's not the colonies. They told us we're independent of the Crown's protection. And yep. legally, we know how that works. Yep. That means we're not subject to him anymore. Mm-hmm. All right, Grievance 24. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. Yeah, that's, those are all bad things. <laughs> that's part of waging cruel war against us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy, scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages, and unworthy the head of a civilized nation. Yeah, so That's it, referring it, to German soldiers. They weren't big yeah. fans of German soldiers. Hes- no, Hessian it, mercenaries. Yeah, it's, a, it's an irony that, you know, the guy who ends up being the drill master for the continental army is also a german a different kind of german prussian not hessian but you know there is that but you know i think that the, you know the the key point here is that there's they're expecting and you know there are, there's similar language that they used about the fact that the royal governors encouraged indian tribes to to join the fight as well basically saying we have some expectation that people who are part of our culture our you know people will feel some compunction about treating us horribly. But you don't have that same right. expectation of people who are not part of your community. Yeah, and that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, you know. Anyway. He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. And that's, again, it's a logical argument because exactly what David was saying, the reason why these Hessians are going to be barbarous is exactly why it's horrible to make your own countrymen fight against you. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, and that's, that, an, that was, that's a reference that, that's to... That's just referring to conscription. That's been, that's a, that was a standing policy of the British Navy. It had been around forever. But yeah. it was rare to use conscripts to fight other Englishmen. Yeah. And impressment, which is, that's, you know, the technical term for basically conscripts at sea is you're, you're pressed into a ship's crew. Yeah, press but that would, Yeah, that would become a, a, a cause of, you know, the War of 1812 as well. British... Yeah, because they kept uh, doing it. <laughs> yeah, British naval crews continued to press Americans on American ships. And, yeah, it, so this is an ongoing grievance that we, we would have with the British. He has excited domestic insurrections among us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Yeah. Now, Which is, this is, you know, that, that's a, obviously Indians are not going to abide by the same rules of warfare. He may use language we're not comfortable with nowadays, but yeah. obviously at this period, 18th century, there were rules of war. Men were expected to be gentlemanly in warfare. I don't know if the Indians had their own rules of war. They very well may have, but yeah. certainly we didn't know them. And so they'd be what they right. So when we're looking at what they do, it appears to us to be an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Specifically, they attack civilians. Yeah. That was not very common at all in British warfare, in European warfare at the time. Civilians were almost always avoided. That was actually really true. Oh, until the Napoleonic Wars? I don't know when that stopped. Yeah, well, when and, civilians you know, became fair game. It's a it's a common theme in different types of cultures that, like, you know, there are some cultures where basically every man of military age is considered by both himself and you know the other people around him as a warrior, and that was true of certain 
at least right. cultures in, in North America. Military age male, like American yeah. culture nowadays. We <laughs> consider that to be yeah. true, at least in the countries we're fighting. So, you know, in, you know, the anthropologists sometimes <laughs> You're talk not going to deal with that one. <laughs> not, not right now. That's, that's a topic for another time. But anthropologists will talk about this concept called endemic warfare, which is basically, you know, there's this constant sense. And it's usually, you know, relatively low temperature, but you raid people around you. You, you know, this is just sort of a, a fact of your culture. And when that's the case, you're not going to make stark distinctions between civilians and non-civilians. Because in your context, everyone's a fighter. You know, that's just how you deal with things. And right. obviously, if you're not used to that, if you're not prepared for that, that's going to be terrifying to you. So you may have noticed that's 27 causes. That's all the causes that find their way into the final draft of the Declaration of Independence. I also want to read one more that did end up being struck really for unity among the colonies. They wanted to get a unanimous Declaration of Independence, and they did. Every single state, except for New York, who abstained because... They weren't sure they had the authority from their governor to vote on it. But every single state voted in favor of independence. And that was yeah. very important to them to get that even worth losing what Thomas Jefferson believed was one of the most important parts of the Declaration of Independence. And actually, when he signed copies of the Declaration and handed it out to people later in life, he included this clause in it. So he considers it there in spirit, at least. But uh, it was, I think, Georgia is the one that pushed against it. Maybe South Carolina, too. But here's this clause. He says... He has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere or to incur miserable death in their transportation hither. And then the next cause is related. And he says, exciting those very people to rise in arms against us and to purchase that liberty of which he has deprived them by murdering the people on whom he has obtruded them thus paying off their former crimes committed against the liberties of one people with crimes he urges them to commit against the lives of another. This is a reference to the fact that he would offer slaves freedom in exchange for fighting for Great Britain. Yeah. But Even though he is the very person, the government of Great Britain is the very entity that transported them here against their will in the first place. Yeah. And I, I noted, think it is a horrendous abuse on both ends. Yeah. As we noted efforts in the colonies to ban the slave trade, reduce the slave trade, reduce the scope of slavery itself were resisted by the British, forbidden by the British, in part because they were still highly dependent on a slave economy. And an instance of, of hypocrisy on the part of the British crown where, you know, you're foisting this institution on us on one end and then you're trying to exploit it to, you know, yeah. to fight For, against. Forcing us to be complicit in slavery. Yeah. Against yeah. our will, because slavery was never an institution the colonists wanted. The British imposed that because of economic advantages that it offered. And then, of course, you know, some of the southern states became dependent upon the institution of slavery and then very famously didn't want it abolished. And, yeah, you know, that obviously. was one of the main causes that ended up leading to a very bloody war later yeah. in our history. Anyway, yeah. th those are the Bill of Particulars. Let me move on to the, the rest of the Declaration of Independence then. In every stage of these oppressions... We have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. I mean, I just love how succinct he is, where he's, you know, yeah, that's, that's it. He just summarized <laughs> it. That's, that's yeah. what it comes down to. Yeah, I think that part's pretty straightforward. So next part is going to be, <laughs> nor have we, sorry, nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here, which, again, remember, was largely for liberty because mm -hmm. they didn't like the way things were going on in Great Britain, whether it was they didn't like the reign of Mary and they wanted to have religious liberty here, or whether it was economic independence, whatever, it was liberty. So we have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They, too, have been deaf to the voice of justice and consanguinity. We must, therefore, acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind. Enemies in war, in peace, friends. That part's very sad. You know, there, there was actually a petition. So, so John Dickinson, I think John Dickinson wrote this, but 
he was obviously, because he ends up voting against the Declaration of Independence, although to his credit, he does go then and fight, fight and fight for the Continental Army. So he does fight for the resolution that the Continental Congress has enacted. But it's not that he's unsympathetic to the ideas of independence. He certainly views these offenses as grievous indeed. He just thinks that, you know, it's going too far to declare independence. And I think just a few months earlier, he'd actually written a petition to the people of Great Britain. So most of their petitions have been to the king. Many of them have been to parliament. He wrote one directly to the people of Great Britain. And even there, we didn't receive any response to it. So that's, this is this section here, this paragraph is just also written to the people of Great Britain. We're not saying we have any particular issue with them. They haven't really wronged us in any way. We really wish they would have helped us out, but they didn't. So we'll regard them enemies in war in peace, France. Yeah. Sad. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our actions, do in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these United Colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from any allegiance to the British crown and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And that as free and independent states, they have the full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may have right to. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And they did. Uh-huh. <laughs> I mean, it's just they did. It's, it's Benjamin Franklin said right after they passed it. He said, "You know, if, if we don't hang together, we will most assuredly hang separately." Yeah. And they they knew what they were committing by doing this. The price they paid for our liberty was high indeed. Yeah, that's that's the Declaration of Independence. I don't I don't know that I have any more to say about that now that we're at about yeah. the two hour mark. Yeah, Gosh. I just I just want to observe <laughs> that in this this is you know to tie this back to the project that I said we're going to be doing for a few weeks this summer at least the comparison of you know American origins and the origins of the French Republic. I think that there's a huge disservice that's been done to the Declaration by only focusing on the beginning of it where it sounds the most similar to similar things in the French Revolution. And uh, it's still pretty different. It is. It is. But, you know, <laughs> you know, there, there's language in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen that sounds sort of similar to this, you know, things about it's got it's got the life, nature. liberty, property yeah. combo, although ours yeah. is not actually that. But right. Um, <laughs> you know, there, there are elements that are similar, but I think people have so, you know, misconstrued what this document is that it makes it sound like as was the case in France, that this was just an experiment in government, basically, you know, coming out of the enlightenment where we're, you know, we're saying, Oh, the old ways of doing things were irrational and and prejudiced. We just want to try literally the opposite. They like the old way of doing things. Yeah. (laughs) And, and, And they want to give their cause and reason for why they should be permitted to go back to the old way of doing things. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it strikes me that the form that this document takes, you know, you compared it to a legal complaint, which obviously it is, but people who've read a number of contracts will be familiar with like, you know, the recitations that come at the beginning of a contract often have the form mm-hmm. of like, whereas this, whereas that, you know, whereas this is a business and this is a business and they want to do this, they're forming this contract. The famous part, you know, that all the language about you know, the, the rights of, of, you know, the natural. <laughs> That's the part where you're defining terms in the contract and saying yeah. who the parties are. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then the important part is, and then you did all this stuff to us, you broke the bonds, and therefore we're no longer beholden to you. That's well, what the important part is. And it's a testament to Thomas Jefferson's brilliance that that formal introduction stuff actually is a profound statement of political philosophy. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, like, I don't mean to make light of it, but, like, it's function in the document is not the central one. It's the background. And that's very important, right. obviously. It's, well, it's, it's also, it's why those things matter. Yeah. Like why you ought to even care about these abuses and usurpations. Because obviously the king's going to say, oh, I may have been horrible to you, but you're still my people. You got to do what I say. Yeah. So that's the reason why, no, in fact, we do not have to do what you say based on essentially, you know, legal philosophy that everybody in the British Empire agrees with. Yeah. 
Yeah. So you can't deny any of this stuff. Yeah. And so I, I think it's important to bear that in mind that, you know, as we talked about earlier, this wasn't supposed to be a radical break with the past and the establishment of some completely new thing. It was what he said it was in the beginning, an effort of the people to arrange government so as to protect their already existing rights. Well, and, this isn't even the arrangement of government. This is just asserting their right to do that. Well, right. And, you know, clearly under the British crown, it wasn't happening. So first step, right. we're no longer going to, you know, consider ourselves to be under its authority. I love that. Did, you're reading through it this time. The line that really struck me was that they can't abolish the legislative power. <laughs> it's it's always yeah. going to reside in the people anyway. I just, yeah. I love that because... They can't disagree with that. You can't no, actually abolish that, the legislative power because it's derived from the people. It's pure Locke, too. <laughs> like, you know, that yeah. is just a clear statement of Locke's philosophy. Anyway. Go on our website, lexrex.org. <laughs> <click> on store. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, anyway. I, I did want to... So, obviously, these men mutually pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. So, to end us, I wanted to read briefly what yeah. happened well and let's men. note that this is because you know for our fourth of july episode this is instead of our usual hot take segment we're not going to do that this time we're going to do this instead to close this out yeah. when the 56 signers of the declaration of independence attached their signatures to that document each knew that they were committing treason against the british crown if caught and captured they risked death but death would not be swift it would be by hanging to the point of unconsciousness, then being revived, disemboweled, their body parts boiled in oil, and their ashes scattered to the wind. Our founding fathers valued freedom for themselves and their posterity, to the extent that they found this fate worth the risk. This story below tells what happened to the men who signed the Declaration of Independence. Five signers were captured by the British and brutally tortured as traitors. Nine fought in the War of Independence and died from wounds or from hardships they suffered. Two lost their sons in the Continental Army. Another two had sons captured. At least a dozen of the 56 had their homes pillaged and burned. What kind of men were they? 25 were lawyers or jurists. 11 were merchants. Nine were farmers or large plantation owners. One was a teacher, one a musician, one a printer. These were men of means and education. Yet they signed the Declaration of Independence, knowing full well that the penalty could be death if they were captured. In the face of the advancing British Army, the Continental Congress fled from Philadelphia to Baltimore on December 12, 1776. It was an especially anxious time for John Hancock, the president, as his wife had just given birth to a baby girl. Due to the complications stemming from the trip to Baltimore, the child lived only a few months. William Ellery's signing at the risk of his fortune proved only too realistic. In December 1776, during three days of British occupation of Newport, Rhode Island, Ellery's house was burned and all his property destroyed. Richard Stockton, a New, New Jersey State Supreme Court Justice, had rushed back to his estate near Princeton after signing the Declaration of Independence to find that his wife and children were living like refugees with friends. They had been betrayed by a Tory sympathizer who had also revealed Stockton's own whereabouts. British troops pulled him from his bed one night beat him, and threw him in jail where he almost starved to death. When he was finally released, he went home to find his estate had been looted, his possessions burned, and his horses stolen. Judge Stockton had been so badly treated in prison that his health was ruined, and he died before the war's end. His surviving family had to live the remainder of their lives off of charity. Carter Braxton was a wealthy planter and trader. One by one, his ships were captured by the British Navy. He loaned a large sum of money to the American cause. It was never paid back. He was forced to sell his plantations and mortgage his other properties to pay his debts. Thomas McKean was so hounded by the British that he had to move his family almost constantly. He served in the Continental Congress without pay and kept his family in hiding. Vandals or soldiers both looted the properties of Climore, Hall, Harrison, Hopkinson, and Livingston. Seventeen lost everything they owned. Thomas Hayward Jr., Edward Rutledge, and Arthur Middleton, all of South Carolina, were captured by the British during the Charleston campaign in 1780. They were kept in dungeons at the St. Augustine prison until exchanged a year later. At the Battle of Yorkton, Thomas Nelson Jr. noted that the British General Cornwallis had taken over the family home for his headquarters. Nelson urged that General George Washington open fire on his home. This was done and the home was destroyed. Nelson later died bankrupt. Francis Lewis also had his home and properties destroyed. The British jailed his wife for two months, and that and other hardships from the war so affected her health that she died only two years later. 
Honest John Hart, a New Jersey farmer, was driven from his wife's bedside when she was near death. Their 13 children fled for their lives. Hart's fields and his gristmill were laid waste. Over a year, he eluded capture by hiding in nearby forests. He never knew where his bed would be the next night, and he often slept in caves. When he finally returned home, he found that his wife had died, his children disappeared, and his farm and stock were completely destroyed. Hart himself died in 1779 without ever seeing any of his family again. Such were the stories and sacrifices typical of those who risked everything to sign the Declaration of Independence. These men were not wild-eyed, rabble-rousing ruffians. They were soft-spoken men of means and education. They had security, but they valued liberty more. Standing tall, straight, and unwavering, they pledged. For the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your 4th of July. I hope that's not too much of a downer, but <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's worth remembering. Yeah. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll listen again.